Okay, everyone. Welcome to my best movies of 2019. This year has been jam-packed with a lot of great movies. And now I finally get to talk about those great movies. After talking about the movies that surprised me, the movies that let me down, the very bad ones, the ones that got overlooked and underrated, and doing my annual comic book ranking and the franchise ending ranking, it's time to talk about all 67 movies I saw in 2019 that I loved, that impacted me, that got the biggest reaction out of me, that made me feel something. Some of these are perfect scores, some of them are four stars, some of them are four and a half, or some of them I just wanted to put on there for the sake of putting on there. But there are 67 movies, so by the time you see this, I will have seen 1917 and Just Mercy. But those reviews won't drop until the beginning of the new year. But anyways, this is going to be a long one, so if you don't want to sit through the entire video, I will leave the list in the description down below for those who don't want to sit through the video. But with that being said, let's get started. Oh, and by the way, there is, there is no top 10, no top 20. This is all the best. All the great epitaphs that I saw in the year 2019. Now, before I get started, be sure to tell me in the comment section down below what are some of your favorite movies of the year. Do you agree with my list? Do you disagree? And I did not see every great movie in this this year. I didn't see The Nightingale. I didn't see Parasite. I didn't see Uncut Gems. I didn't see Loose. I didn't see the Amazon Prime movie with Adam Driver. Be I was just focusing on the ones that I wanted to see. And now and I did good at that. So with that being said, be sure to follow all my social media links in the description down below. To my Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, Stars, and all that great stuff. And with that being said, let's get started. <laughs> mentions we have blinded by the lights great film definitely should have been seen by a lot more people crisis on infinite earth technically this doesn't finish until 2020 on january 14th but when it does i will review it but for right now the first three parts i love it so far i don't like ruby rose's batwoman though because she does nothing but this is still a great crossover from the Arrowverse. It's the Avengers in-game of the Arrowverse crossovers. Cold Pursuit with Liam Neeson, Laura Dern, and Emmy Rossum. A very awesome film. I very much enjoy it. Shaft. Unicorn Store. The Kid Who Would Be King. Triple Frontier. Nancy Drew in the Hidden Staircase, Justice League vs. The Fatal Five, and Yesterday. Those are all my honorable mentions, all really great films, but just couldn't make it on this list. But what did make it on my list, in no particular order... We all need grace. We all need mercy. Amen. I got my truth back. You gave that to me. And ain't nobody gonna take that from us. Just mercy. Now, for most people, they won't be able to see this until January, but Just Mercy, this was a great drama about lawyer Brian Stevenson trying to help Jamie Foxx's character, who in this movie, Brian Stevenson is played by Jamie Foxx. I mean, Michael B. Jordan. Jamie Foxx plays the... Uh, the victim of a situation crime that he was is not conv convicted of that he didn't do falsely convicted of and so Michael B. Jordan decides to fight to 
to right the wrong that is being done to him. You know, I thought the story was very well done, but this is not a feel-good movie because there is one scene in this movie that is really hard to watch, really intense. But I have to say that what they do in this movie, the way this movie was directed by Dustin Daniel Curtin, who directed The Glass Castle in Short Term 12, he knows what he's doing. I can't wait to see what he does with Shane Chi and The Legend of Ten Rings 2021. Jamie Foxx was absolutely amazing in his role. He definitely deserves the praise he's getting, as well as Michael B. Jordan, who also produced this movie. O'Shea Jackson Jr., Tim Blake Nelson, Brie Larson herself, Captain Marvel herself is also in this movie. The performances are great. It, it is a little slow, and there is one scene in this movie that you are not going to really like, but I thought the performance was great, I thought the story was engaging, and I thought that this was just a very great film. 1917, Sam Mendes' love letter to World War I, and it was great. It was a great love letter to World War I. You can tell this is inspired by his grandfather, who would tell him stories about this. And the way this movie was shot was very great. It's shot as a one-shot take film, and I love movies that does different ways of shooting the film. And the acting was really great from everyone, Benedict Cumberbatch, to all the other great performances in here. A lot of the performances were really well done. The performances were phenomenal. There were some really great scenes in here. This is probably the best war, war movie since Saving Private Ryan. The Saving Private Ryan is still the best. But this is easily one of the best war films. Now you won't be some people won't be able to see this till January, but this was a really amazing film that definitely deserves to be checking out. It is awesome. Your destiny. Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker, or The Rise of Skywalker, as I label it, without putting the name of the episode. This movie got a lot of unfair backlash, and I do agree with the criticisms. Yes, Rey is overpowered. I defended Rey in the first two films in the sequel trilogy. This time, I can't really defend her, even though she is a badass, but there is, she does way too much with the Force in this movie. Some of the characters are underwritten. It doesn't fully 100% do good with most of its twists and turns. But, oh, and yes, this movie definitely needed a three hour runtime or a split into two parts to fully tell the story that it needs to tell because there is just way too much going on in one movie. But, the Rise of Skywalker was a nice send-off to the Skywalker Saga, and I'm looking forward to seeing what Disney does with Star Wars in the next decade. And I can't wait for Season 2 of The Mandalorian, because that has been announced today, and I will be reviewing Season 1 in the next decade as well. But The Rise of Skywalker was really great. The performances were great, J.J. Abrams did the best he could. But the problem I feel like with the sequel trilogy is that there, there should have been at least one clear vision. But at the end of the day, The Rise of Skywalker was still a really good movie. And it's doing good at the box office, but it is kind of struggling a bit. See, time to go. Sleepy night night! I miss my hands. I gotta stay! We have different. 
different skill sets. That's what makes us such a great team. Walter, you're squeezing too. Oh! Huh? What happens in the submarine stays in the submarine. Spies in disguise. This was a nice surprise. I ended up thinking this move was gonna suck, but it did not suck. It actually was better than I thought it was gonna be. The voice actors, Will Smith, Rashida Jones, Tom Holland, Karen Gillan, DJ Khaled. The voice acting was really great. I liked the story. I had a lot of good laughs. There were some, only a few, some things that didn't really work. I didn't really care too much for the villain. And I feel like there, there were some jokes that you could have easily took it out but it was still fun the kids movie from blue sky animation is probably the best blue sky movie they've done in this decade besides the rio movies the spies in the skies was a really great film i can't wait to review that for y'all i report the facts you've ruined this man's life there is a bomb in centennial park you have 30 minutes do a couple in a row my son saved people's lives. There is a bomb in Centennial Park. You have 30 minutes. You set that bomb. There is a bomb in Centennial Park. You have 30 minutes. I don't know how to protect you. I think your client is guilty as hell. They want to fry you. Richard Jewell. I just uploaded a review of this a few days ago so if you haven't seen my review of that you can go check it out this is a movie that definitely should have done a lot more at the boss office a lot of people just overlooked Richard Jewell because they're not familiar with the story of the guy who was falsely accused by the FBI and the news reporting company that framed him as a terrorist you really feel bad for Richard Jewell and throughout the movie and seeing what he has to overcome with the help of his lawyer and seeing how his mom, played by Kathy Bates, is reacting to it. And the cast was great. Philip, uh, Paul to Hauser, Olivia Wilde, John Hamm, Sam Rockwell, Kathy Bates. Clint Eastwood's direction was really great. This is just a good movie. If you ain't seen Richard Jewell, I recommend you watch Richard Jewell. Like now. Love is just all a woman is fit for. I'm so sick of it. Little Women. Little Women, this was a really great film. Considering the fact that this book has been done eight times and this movie being the eighth time they've done this, this was actually really good. This is actually really good. I really thought they had something going here. Greta Gerwig, Keep doing what you're doing because you're a great director. I loved what you did with this movie and I think that you really did an awesome job directing this. And I actually liked this more than Lady Bird. I did watch the, the Little Women one with Maya Hawk from 2017 to prepare for this one. And that one was great, so I will review that one as well, even though they're both the same story, but I have two different opinions on them. But I liked them both, but I love this one more. Emma Watson, Eliza Scanlon, Timothy Chalamet, Meryl Streep, Florence Pugh. This has been the year of Florence Pugh. I can't wait to see what she does in Black Widow, though, and sales are run on. So, Little Women, definitely go see it. It's out now. Jumanji, 
the next level. This was a really great film that is not as good as Welcome to the Jungle or the original, but on its own, it's still a pretty funny movie. The cast from the first one, The Rock, Kevin Hart, Karen Gillan as Ruby Ryle House. Jack Black, they all do great as far as the kids who are basically what the four main leads are playing as their avatar in the game world. They're really great. Nick Jonas, Aquafina, Dean DeVille, Dan Clover. I like the fact that The Rock and Kevin Hart has to play those two. It did have its moments where it where the editing was a little bit off and the villain just like Welcome to the Jungle is not memorable but the, le the next level is still pretty good and I can't wait to see what they do in a possible fourth movie four, fifth movie with the four main actors technically third if you don't count the original Jumanji I gotta sit down, everybody says so. No, I'm not sitting down, I can't do it! It's what it is. What it is. I know things. They don't know I know. It's gonna happen. Either way, he's going. You know, I don't, uh... I don't care whether you did it or not. That makes no difference to me. Yeah, I don't. I'm here to defend you, right? Right. What do you want to know? You want to know if I did it or not? <laughs> the Irishman. Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. If this is, if this was Martin Scorsese's last film that he directed, which his next movie is supposed to be a film with. Leonardo DiCaprio so I'm not sure if that's going to be the case but I'm curious to see what he does with that film but The Irishman this is a great film that premiered on Netflix and this easily should have went into theaters for longer because The Irishman was a really phenomenal film great performances from Robert De Niro, Al Pacino Joe Pesci, Bobby Cannavale, Anna Paquin. All the acting was great. The way Martin Scorsese dressed this movie, and this is his return to mafia films, and this is just as great as Goodfellas. Goodfellas was absolutely great. I will be reviewing that in 2020. I still go around for a channel update to see what's gonna happen in 2020. Um. The movie, my, my issue with the film is that it didn't need to be three hours and 29 minutes, but I get what they were doing, telling the story of Robert De Niro's character in flashbacks, and the de-aging looks damn good for the $159 million budget they have. But again, I feel like it, it's, in terms of the last half of the movie, probably in the 20 minute mark, I was getting ready to say, can we um, wrap this movie up? But it took me two days to watch it. So it did take me a long time to review it. But I'm glad I watched The Irishman. I, hopefully they Netflix put this movie out on DVD and Blu-ray, because I would buy it. Eventually, it'll be the two of you having to figure this out. Together. If we start from a place of reasonable and they start from a place of crazy, when we settle, we'll be somewhere between reasonable and crazy. Same with another Netflix movie, Marriage Story, Scar Johansson and Adam Driver. What happens when you have Kylo Ren and Black Widow playing a married couple going through the process of a divorce? You get a great film. This movie is very realistic. It didn't lie to you, it doesn't pull any punches, it just, it just 
was a great movie. Noah Baumbach wrote and directed a great film that go goes through the ups and downs of divorce and the things that happens with these two characters throughout the course of the movie. You don't side with either of them. You feel for both sides and that's what I appreciated with Marriage Story. And that scene that everybody's been talking about on Twitter. That was a great scene. One of the best written scenes. And it did have its moments of being a little too long. And there were parts where it did kind of overly went realistic. I still thought that Marriage Story was, was good. This is a great film. Definitely worth a shot. Knives Out. Knives Out. This is a whodunit movie from Ryan Johnson. And this shows that when Ryan Johnson is not under the hands of Kathleen Kennedy, he can make a great film. And even though I love The Last Jedi, there were some decisions in The Last Jedi I thought he should have thought twice about. But, Knives Out was really great. I love the murder mystery aspect of this movie. The way it's done for a fresher and modern audience. And this movie is making money, so hopefully we do get a sequel to this, but I kind of doubt it. But all in all, the cast was great. Daniel Craig with his southern accent. Chris Evans. Anna the lovely Anna de Armas from Blade Runner 2049 and Knock Knock and No Time to Die and War Dogs. Jaden Martell, Tony Collette, Jamie Lee Curtis, Catherine Langford from 13 Reasons Why and Love Simon. It's good to see her moving on pre 13 Reasons Why. Performances were great, the twists and turns were great. I had no complaints. Even the music was good. So, Ron Johnson, pat yourself on the back because this was great. Loved Knives Out. Notes from Melanie. This was directed by Chris Stuckman, who is a YouTuber who reviews movies and anime. And I gotta say, I want to put this higher. I really wanted to. But the thing that holds this movie back is that it is only 19 minutes long, but notes from Melanie for the 19 minutes long shorts. He's very, this was a very good passion project for him and he really brought his A game with this. He knew what he was doing. Even the cast was really great. I really like the story of a mockbuster director trying to do his first serious script because you, any movie maker can relate to something like this. You're trying to step out of the comfortable zone and do something different with your filmmaking career. And that's why I appreciate it with Notes for Melanie. And that's why it's on this list. <laughs> Hooking up with them. No, they're not hooking up yet. Let it snow. What Netflix has been it hitting it hard this year. And I gotta say, this is one of the best films. This was a really great film with a large ensemble cast. Isabella Merced, or Monier, Shamik Moore, aka Miles Morales, Kiernan Shipka, aka Sabrina Spellman, Anna Akana, Jacob Babylon. A lot of performances in this movie were great. I really liked the, the aspects that they went on with all these different characters in their different stories 
And this is based on a book by John Green. And John Green adaptations are really good. The Fault in Our Stars was good. Purple Towns was good. And this is a good one. So, I gotta say, Let It Snow is a really great film that I feel like a lot of people kind of didn't didn't see. And this is this is a great one that is definitely on Netflix if you want to check it out. It is awesome. I really loved it. I'm so hot. Uh, do you have any ice in this tan? Oh. Hello. We like your pants. They're jolly. They're yoga pants, like yours. These are my yogurt pants. No, no yoga pants. I love yogurt pants. Downward facing reindeer. Don't do that. Please. <gasps> wow. That's a big deal in here. Oh, well, was a Disney Plus movie that definitely was surprising. It did have the usual cliches, but Noel was not bad for a Disney Plus original film with Anna Kendrick and Bill Hatter. Like the story of the sister having to take over after the brother kind of messed things up in the North, in the North Pole. It had a very good Christmas feel to it. And all in all, it was just a really good movie. It was a really good movie. I thought the whole point was to win the damned race. this were a beauty pageant, we just lost. Looks on everything. Ford v. Ferrari. This movie, Ford v. Ferrari, this was great. A great racing film. James Mangold, at this point, he is showing that he can't do no wrong. Walk the Line, Identity, this movie, and The Wolverine, and Logan, two of the best Wolverine movies, the only two good Wolverine movies in the Wolverine trilogy. He directed a great two hour and 32 minute long drama biopic about the, conf the confliction, be the rivalry between Ford and Ferrari, Matt Damon, Christian Bale, and the entire cast did a great job. The racing scenes were really good. It did go on for too long, and but at the same time, I could have went for an extra couple of minutes because I was enjoying the movie that much. But Ford v Ferrari was great. It really was a good movie that everyone should check out if you ain't seen it right now by now. We gotta be our own heroes. We sure as hell could make some noise. When the Daily Planet said Superman is dead, it painted a target on the Earth. How do we even begin to fight that? Ring of the Superman. I loved the, the death of Superman and Ring of the Superman was just as good as that, even better. You, yes, it's dealing with Superman being dead, and yes, it does go for the whole what they did with the Ring of Superman comics with Cyborg Superman and all the multiple Supermans. But it was a nice addition to the DC animated universe because right now we're not. They're not doing anything with Superman live action right now. Apparently, hopefully, Man Still 2 comes. Those who like Man of Steel will actually care. Because I'm still waiting for it. But Ring of Superman is a really good animated film in the DC animated animated universe.
God damn, Dolomite. Great God in heaven, you know I love you. Cut. Was it good as shave? Horn of Eddie Murphy here. Dolomite is my name. Thank goodness Eddie Murphy is back to his roots. Because even though, like I said, I like most of his family friendly movies, they're, most of his other ones are pretty terrible. A Thousand Words was terrible. Meet Dave was terrible, even though he had Elizabeth Banks. But Eddie Murphy still shows why he is still a funny actor and still a great actor. Craig Brewer, the director of Hustle and Flow, directed this movie, and they're both reuniting again for Coming to America 2 next year in December. So I can't wait to see what they do with Coming to America 2. I like the story of Eddie Murphy playing Rudy Ray Moore, and he creates a character named Dolomite. Mike Epps, Craig Robinson, the rest of the cast was really great. The story I was very interested in. And this this shows why Eddie Murphy is still awesome. So give yourself a round of applause, Mr. Mr. Eddie Murphy. Cause you deserve it for this this awesome movie. This is gonna get a little controversial and there are some controversial movies on this list Terminator 6 or Terminator Dark Fates okay I get the criticism okay I get the criticism that it's the same is the same movie as Terminator 2 and at this point it has gotten old very quickly I can see why this movie bombed yeah, I know there were clashes between James Cameron and Tim Miller, but I gotta tell you that I really loved Terminator Dark Fate. Now, not as much as the other Terminators 1 and 2 or even 3 and Salvation, but I thought this was a little better than Genesis. I will admit, I am one of those people who I hate the first five minutes of this movie. What they do with John Connor is unforgivable. But at the same time, I'm like, what else, what else can you really do with John Connor at this point? But I do feel like if you have had him go through, not, through not being the lead, go, being the one with the whole Skynet thing and have him have a sacrificial scene in protecting Danny played by Natalia Reyes who's gorgeous by the way and she's great in the movie I do feel like that would have been a better wrap up than what we got I like Linda Hamilton, I liked Mackenzie Davis I love what they did with Arnold Schwarzenegger this time around Gabriel Luna was a pretty awesome villain. But yeah, Terminator Dark Fate. It's not the best Terminator movie, but it is nowhere near as bad as most people make it out to be. And it's not the, and I do admit that you could easily lay off the whole feminism card with this movie. But Terminator Dark Fate wasn't the worst Terminator movie. Are you kidding me? Get the heck on with that. Scary stories to tell in the dark. This movie... I was interested in scary stories to tell in the dark. And I really liked scary stories to tell in the dark. It wasn't a masterpiece, but... For what we got... Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark was a fun little anthology movie that came out on my birthday month. And I'm so glad it did come out on my birthday month this year. Because this was fun. This was a fun film. And between this and another movie I'll get to which came out later on my birthday. I like I like those these this more than Hobbs and Shaw. 
even though I like Fast and Furious Hobbs and Shaw, which is also another honorable mention, that movie was 2 hours and 15 minutes too long. But, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark was a fun movie produced by Guillermo del Toro with these kids and these different kinds of creatures. It didn't have the best character development and it did drag on in the pacing for a little bit, but it was still a pretty good movie. With some interesting direction, good performances, some kind of lackluster characters, but Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark was still fun. I'm just ready to get the hell out of there. Black women don't get the same recognition as our white counterparts. And I wish that would change. A grown man, 50 something years old. That's not acceptable, nowhere. Nowhere. Surviving R. Kelly. Ooh. There's a difference between Up until R. Kelly. Until I watched this, I was a fan of R. Kelly. Still listen to most a few of his songs, but laughing, after sitting through this, this documentary showed everything you you don't know about R. Kelly. So if you are one of them people who is a fan of R. Kelly, you're not gonna like what this doc mini series have to provide. And there is gonna be another part to it coming in January. So this is hard to watch especially from a guy who was previously a fan of R. Kelly I still I'll still listen to most of his music but he deserved what he got because all the drama that he has done R. Kelly but surviving R. Kelly was a really good documentary Top of the pyramid. I'm worried about you. What is going on? It's Sayonara for you, bitch. <gasps> Oopsie. The secret lives of cheerleaders. The secret lives of cheerleaders. Just when I thought I was not gonna put a TV movie on my list, this came and surprised me. I really liked Secret Life of Cheerleaders. Like I said, the cheerleaders are despicable and they are some of the most I'm the most unlikable cheerleaders that you have seen in any cheerleader movie. This ain't bring it on, this ain't your usual typical cheerleader TV movie thriller. It does have some issues, but I did like the performances of the cast from Savannah May and Denise Richards and the rest of the cast. So the Secret Life of Pets, surprisingly, not a terrible TV movie from Lifetime. Oh god, nothing makes sense anymore. Yeah, I know, it's definitely not a good time to be a Nazi. The Rabbit. I can't believe I'm saying this. A Takaya Watiti movie actually makes my best movies of the year. I can't believe I'm saying that. Because Takaya Watiti, I wasn't the biggest fan of him when he directed Thor Ragnarok until I got into his directing style with What We Do in Shadows, and then I appreciated Thor Ragnarok more. I still have issues with Thor Riding the Rock, but it was a really damn good movie. And I have fun with Jojo Rabbit. I like the satirical stuff that's going on. I really enjoy the performances of Thomas Ian McKenzie, Scar Johansson, Rebel Wilson, Takaya Wasiti, even the actor who plays Joe plays our title character. He was really great. Some There were some actors who did get underused and there were some jokes that I questioned. 
because this movie is very polarizing for a lot of people, but for me, the satirical comedy works. I like the comedic take on Hitler and the World War I. And anything with Scarlett Johansson is an automatic win. But Jojo Rabbit is still a really good movie. That is definitely worth checking out. Fast and Furious presents Hobbs and Shaw. Just when I thought I would not put this in my best of 2019, I ended up doing it anyway. Now, I, I did give this movie a fair review, saying I liked it, but the big issue with this movie is that it was a little too lengthy, especially for a Fast and Furious movie. This is probably the second longest Fast and Furious movie right next to Furious 7. But for a spinoff with Luke Hobbs and Deku Shaw, I have fun with it. At this point, the Fast and Furious series knows what it is. At this point, this is a series that has gone from street racing to now becoming a much more action oriented franchise with cars. When you go into Fast and Furious movies, you're gonna have the cars, you're gonna have guns, you're gonna have fights, you're gonna have the girls, of course, but Hobbs and Shaw was very fun. I enjoyed myself with it, and this came out on August 2nd, so it was a nice little surprise before I hit the 21st birthday on the week after this movie's release. Jason Statham as Deku Shaw and The Rock as Luke Hobbs, they work pretty well with each other. They still have the little back and forth banter that everyone loved in Fade of Furious. And it works here. And they both also produced the, this movie as well, so that was also another positive. The, David Leach, who has directed directed the De Deadpool 2 and do helped with the John Wick movies. He knows what he's doing as far as the direction goes. I do like the way this movie is directed. There's just a lot of non-stop action that just keeps hitting you and hitting you and hitting you. The plot is a bit ridiculous, but again, it's a Fast and Furious movie, but you're gonna know you gotta know what you're going into when you're watching a Fast and Furious movie. And I did like the chemistry of The Rock and Jason Statham. That is the best part of this movie. And surprisingly, I liked Vanessa Kirby as the sister of Decker Shaw. I thought she was pretty awesome. She was pretty badass. And I liked her here more than I did in Mission Impossible Fallout. Because in Mission Impossible Fallout, I thought she was good, but she wasn't really needed in the film. Then you have Isaac Gonzalez as the ex-love interest as Jason Statham, and while she's not in it very much, she does leave a lasting impression. And is Isaac Gonzalez she's hot? And Idris Elba as the villain, as the as supposedly the block Superman. He was pretty pretty entertaining and fun to watch as the villain. He's hemming it up, he's having a good time. But he's not really the best villain. His plans kinda of like luster and the, the I don't really understand his motivation, but you don't come for a deep plot or great villains. You just come to Fast and Furious movies to have fun. With fast cars, fighting, guns, explosions, girls, party, and to see Dom, Nick Toretto, and, or, these, or in this movie's case, these two guys doing it is that they do. Whooping their ass and them taking them names. And like I said, it does go on for 2 hours and 10 minutes, or 15 minutes too long. And you could have easily cut at least 30 minutes out, and this would have been a better film. I did like seeing Helen Mirren, and I did love the cameos from Kevin Hart and 
Roman Reigns and all of the other cameos in this movie. But Hobbs and Shaw, it's a fun time. It's a fun time. If they ever do a sequel to this, I wouldn't mind. As long as you have the awesomeness that was, that was in this movie. And have a better villain next time. Abominable. Abominable was a fun DreamWorks animation film. I really liked the story. I dig it. It was a good movie. It's not one of DreamWorks' best films, but it was a lot better than the freaking Boss Baby, which the sequel comes out next year. Oh shit, the Boss Baby too. Oh god, no, no. I gotta review the Boss Baby too, don't I? Great. But at least we got Trolls World Tour, so that's something. But Abominable was a very good movie. Very nice surprise. I, re I really liked the story between the human character and the Yeti. Voice acting was great from Sarah Paulson, Chloe Bennett, to the guy who play does the voice of the young kid. The direction was great. The animation was solid. Sarah Paulson was great. I didn't really like her as the villain. But she still did a good job. She still did a phenomenal, a great job, actually. Damn good job. And that's the biggest compliment I have to give to Abominable was being a good time. It was a good time. And I liked it. Dora and the Lost City of Gold. I admit, I thought the idea of a Dora movie was awful. Like, why are we making a Dora movie in the last year of decade? But then, when I saw the movie, I'm not gonna lie. I was actually really impressed with Dora and the Lost City of Gold. I thought Dora and the Lost City of Gold had some something to it. And this is definitely one of the better TV app to app take movie movie app to, m movie to TV TV to movie adaptations. Isabella Merced or Monier was absolutely gorgeous as Dora. She is, and she's a beautiful Latina, Peruvian babe. So there's that. I really like Isabella Monier as an actress. I can't wait to see what she does in 2020. And as far as acting and her music, because she has a great singing voice. Jeff Wahlberg, I really liked as Diego. I really like Danny Trejo as Boots. Michael Pena and Eva Longoria was really great. It did take a while for the story to kick in, and there were some jokes that didn't really work, and I didn't really care for the villain. But what they needed to get right with this Dora movie, they got right. And that is the biggest praise I have to give to Dora and the Lost City of Gold. It's for knowing what it was. It, it reminded me a lot of Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, as well as a PG rated version of the game Uncharted. So that was really awesome. And I'm, I'm very happy this that this movie surprised the shit out of me because I was initially hating this movie at first, I'm dreading it, but then the movie came around and it really surprised me. I had a good time. And I can't wait to see Spongebob 3. I think the best thing we can do is to let people know. Boom that each one of them is precious. Next up in this long best of list. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Won't you be my neighbor? Y'all know what it is. A beautiful day in the neighborhood. This 
was a really good movie. Now, I do agree with the criticism that Mr. Rogers should have been in this movie more. I do wish he was in this movie more because I really love Tom Hanks' performance as Mr. Rogers. But I did like what they were doing here, focusing on this man, investigating him and how his life is not going well. He's going through some problems in his life with his dad, hating his dad, his wife, situation with his wife and his family. It was a very heartfelt film that I really liked. I really liked it. And I thought the performance by Matthew Reese and the rest of the cast was really great. You do get some cameos here and you do get some arc and you do get the story of Mr. Rogers but I do wish the movie was more focused on Mr. Rogers than him but I do like when he they do form the bond and they talk. I do love that part. But A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood was absolutely great. And I don't know why why this movie got a lot of the backlash it deserves. Yeah, fine. If you don't like the movie, you don't like it. But you can't deny a movie with Tom Hanks. It's your opinion, but it's not all that bad. I'll get to another movie with Tom Hanks in a, in a, in a minute. Z Super Broly. I'm not the biggest Dragon Ball fan. Let's just get that out of the way right now. I am not the biggest Dragon Ball fan. I was going to get into Dragon Ball back in the 2000s, but then Dragon Ball Evolution came in and screwed it all up for me, and I said, no. But I do like a little bit of the Dragon Ball movies. I like Battle of Gods. I like Resurrection F. And I like this one. I know there are more Dragon Ball movies, so in 2020 I will be getting into more Dragon Ball. But that doesn't change the fact that this is still a freaking awesome movie with Goku and Super Broly and all the classic Dragon Ball characters that you know and love. The Super Saiyan, the fun action and entertaining spectacle. And I'm very glad I gave in. I gave in to a good movie. Now I'm curious to see how the original Dragon Ball is. Because you may you you have I actually have some faith in this Dragon Ball movie again. The series again. Scooby-Doo Return to Zombie Island. I love me some Scooby-Doo, so I easily love this movie. Now, Return, now Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is still the better movie. But I enjoyed Scooby-Doo Return to Zombie Island. This was excellent. This was great. I loved it. I love what they did here. I thought this movie was really good, it was really amazing, it was very well done. It did suffer a little bit in terms of the plot because you're kind of recycling a little bit from Zombie Island, the first one, but I did, it had enough to do something different as well, so that's why I didn't hate it. And I love the voice acting, Matthew Lillard, Kate Mikuchi, and Frank Welker. Can't wait for the new Scooby-Doo movie and animation called Scoob in 2020. And that's gonna be fun. It's gonna be fun times. This is not something people get over. This is something they carry with them forever. Even with people that you can trust, if the truth is inconvenient, they don't. Unbelievable. 
technically this is a mini series, but the reason why it's on this list is because this mini series on Netflix feels like a cinematic experience. I loved this movie. This little mini series. Based on the true story of this girl who lied about being raped and the two cops having to go look for her look to, to prove her innocence and find her attacker. This was very hard hitting, so this is not for everybody in terms of subject matter. But the performances are what is the strongest aspect here, as well as his direction and writing and his characterization. Tony Collette was really great, Merritt Reaver was really great, but the standout of this was the gorgeous Caitlin Dever. If she does not go, she got a Golden Globe nomination. If she does not win at the Golden Globes next year, I'm going to be very upset because Caitlin Dever shows how much of a talented actress she is and she is really pretty. And she was amazing in Booksmart. And I've been following her for a while, but I haven't, didn't know what else she was in, but unbelievable was really good. Okay, look, um... Okay, I want to go first. I met someone. Wow, <laughs> that's, that's so great. We had the most insane, freaky-ass sex. I can't even talk about it, otherwise... Yeah, let's stop happen. talking about it. Always be my maybe. Yes, it does follow the romance cliches that you see in all the other romance movies, but to tell the truth, this was a better romance movie than After and The Last Summer. But I'll get to my favorite romance movie in a, when we get there. Always be my maybe was a very nice surprise. It really, really delivered on what it said it was going to do. It really took the toll on what it wanted to go for. And I like that. I like that. Now I gotta say, the acting was strong. The performances were strong. The characterization was really strong here. I really loved the characterization and the performances of the two leads. The script was very well done. You got Keanu Reeves in here. This has been the year of Keanu Reeves, man. That was awesome. Holy crap. I And I love the little spin on the Mariah Carey song, Always Be My Baby, which is Always Be My Maybe is the title of the movie. But this was a real good film. We have a job to do. Are you ready? I'm ready. Ad Astra. I don't know why everybody slept on this movie, I don't know why everybody hates this movie, and I don't know why this movie didn't get the attention that it deserved. Because Ad Astra was a good freaking movie. A real damn good movie at that. This movie, let me tell you, you cannot never get tired of astronaut movies or movies in space. I love this film. Brad Pitt gave another one of his awesome performances that is very suitable, but very well done. I love the performances of Brad Pitt, Rufin N N N Nigel Nega from Loving. Liv Tyler, Donald Sutherland, the underrated is always Kimberly Elise, 
James Gray directed the crap out of this movie. This movie is directed to its core. And I gotta say, the direction was awesome. And the music was great. The cinematography was great. The story was hard hitting. The perform the way this movie ends was very good. Everything in this movie worked. I don't know why this movie didn't get the critical attention it deserves. I'm glad there are more people who are really enjoying this movie. Some people may find it overrated or tedious or pretentious, but Ad Astra I thought was a really good movie. Yeah. I it was a really good movie and definitely should have done more than it did. The World We Make. This was a really great film. I really loved the world we make. It was a great movie about an interracial couple who is trying to be together and they can't. Any movie that is filmed in the state of Tennessee, you easily got my attention. Because, and I'm so glad Dylan Flickinger recommended this movie to me because the world we make was a good movie that was so was so well handled. I'm very happy how this film turned out. I really love the way this movie played out. It played out very well. And the performances of this movie are really great from the two leads. I really like the writing and the direction. And as somebody who wants to date someone who's not his own skin color, I approve of this. I approve of this movie. Because we all have that feeling that we should that we have we have the rights to date someone who is not our skin color and that's what i desperately appreciated this movie for doing is telling that story for actually going that route and doing that yes i know there are some people who are not going to really be a fan of this movie but if you, if you get the chance, definitely, definitely watch the world we make because this was great. It was, it was great. I loved the world we made. Yeah. When you bring me out, can you introduce me as Joker? One of my biggest surprises of the year, and that is Joker. You know, just when I thought this was going to be Venom 2.0, Joker is not Venom 2.0. This was really, really good. I loved Joker. This was, this was outstanding. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix definitely should get an Oscar nomination for his portrayal of the Joker. It's a very different Joker. It's an original take on the Joker. But I, I appreciated that. In this movie, you don't see Joker until the end of the film. So if you were expecting Joker to pop up way earlier, or if you're expecting a lot of action, this is not going to be for you because this movie is dealing with mental illness, anxiety, and how one man or one person can end up going crazy. And I appreciated that route they took with Joker. Heath Ledger's Joker will always be my favorite Joker, but Joaquin Phoenix is definitely number two if I had to rank the Jokers. Heath Ledger, Joaquin Phoenix, Jack Nicholson, Mark Hamill, Jared Leto, and the worst Joker is Cesar Romero. I'm sorry to anybody of the fans of the Alan West Batman. I don't like Alan West's version of Batman. I don't like the Cesar Romero one. It's too campy. 
Why do you think I hate Batman and Robin so much? And the fact that this is absolutely the first R-rated movie to gross a billion dollars, especially for a comic book movie, is pretty impressive. So I can't wait to see what the DC Media Black Label does with future villains. The Peanut Butter Falcon. This was, of course, a movie that should have gotten a lot more attention because The Peanut Butter Falcon was a really good movie with Dakota Johnson and Shia LaBeouf and the other guy, I forgot what his name is, but he was great too. The performances were great. I really liked the different take on the Huckleberry Finn storyline. The direction and writing was very solid and very strong. And I had a good time with the movie. It does follow the same cliches. But there was enough in this movie to make it different. Not much more to say on the Peanut Butter Falcon than that. Go see you. Until we don't have a choice anymore. You lied. And I died. It Chapter 2. Okay, fine. Oh, I get the criticisms that it's not as scary as the first. But to me, it was scarier as the first. And unpopular opinion, but I'm going to admit it. I think It Chapter 2 was just as great as It Chapter 1. A lot of criticism has gone to the 3 hour run time, but the 2 hours and 49 minutes flew by. It flew by because I was invested. It and it does cut to flashbacks, but that was okay. You get to see each member of the Losers Club where they are 27 years and in two and a half years. I appreciate the fact that New Line Cinema and Warner Brothers they actually took their time with this movie, with both in Chapter One and in Chapter Two instead of rushing it. And I like this part of, I like this half of the IT book with the adults a lot more than I did with the adult version of the Tim Curry one. In fact, I like both, both parts of this new interpretation of IT more than I did the Tim Curry one. The Tim Curry one is good, but when you get to that adult half, it's not, it is, it is let down. It does feel kind of rushed with this one, with the adult portion, but I, I did really enjoy a lot of in here. Bill Skarsgård was still great as Pennywise. I love the original Losers Club members from the first movie, and in this movie, they were great. Jessica Chastain as Beverly Marsh, James McAvoy, who's had a great year with this movie, and Glass. Dark Phoenix wasn't the best, but he was good in it. Isaiah Mustafa, Bill Hader as Richie, who was one of my favorite characters. This movie was creepy, it was scary, and there were some pretty sad moments, especially with the one scene with the, the older Bill and the younger Bill talking to his dead brother. That was a very sad moment, but it was also very creepy. It did drag on in the second half with most of the flashbacks, and there were some CGI moments that I kind of question, but at least, it, at least it wasn't as bad as the spider in the 1990 second half of that miniseries. And you, Elsa, more than anyone or anything. Frozen 2, or Disney's Frozen 2. Six years worth the wait, and it was awesome. For six years for a lot of people, I didn't see the first Frozen until 2014. And just when I thought I was not going to like Frozen 2, Frozen 2, I ended up liking more than the first one. I like the fact that they expand on Elsa and how where she gets her powers from. I love the story here, even though there is a lot going on. 
The songs were really great. Into the Unknown, Kristoff's song, Olaf's song, everyone got a song this time around. The standout song was Show Yourself with Elsa and her late mom singing. I really thought that was a very beautiful moment in the movie. The animation and cinematography is very crisp and clean. It's Disney and they put $150 million into the movie so of course it's gonna look good. And this movie made a billion dollars at the box office and this is now the highest grossing musical. Oh yes, that is the highest grossing musical. That's awesome. But the voice cast was still really great. Indina Menzel, Kristen Bell, Josh Gads, Olaf, they get, he stole the show once again. There's no villain, which is why I really like. There was no villain. The only downside, and the reason why this is number 32, is that even though I appreciate that there's a lot more going on, it does you one it does kind of rush its story in the far in the end of the movie, just to conclude the movie. And I feel like the movie could have been at least an extra ten minutes longer. But I get it, you don't want to drag out this great animated film. But this is definitely one of the best sequels of, in this decade. It's definitely one of the best animated. This is definitely one of my favorite animated movies in this decade. And I'm glad that Frozen 2 happened. If you're one of those people who hated Frozen 2, you ain't gonna like this one. But the majority wins again. So, Elsa did has done for a lot of audiences what she hasn't done for what most with Charlie's Angels 2019 did I'm gonna say it unpopular opinion but I'm gonna go ahead and admit it Frozen 2 did what Charlie's Angels 2019 did not do entertain me not like other people she smiles at me longer you let this go, the worse it's gonna be. And you haven't got time. I love you. I love her. All Creatures Here Below. This was a good one. All Creatures Here Below was really good. Very overlooked film. Definitely should have been seen by a lot more people. Written by David Dalsamashian about two people, Jensen and Ruby and their baby, they're living in abject poverty and they're on the run after they have some dark secrets. David Dasmashian and Karen Gillan worked very well with each other. Jennifer Morrison was great, David Kochner was great. Not the most happiest movie, but this is a very effective dramatic movie that I really enjoyed and I really loved a lot. It really did do, it really was something refreshing to see from a drama. And I applaud that, it for that. So, with that being said, I love the movie. Definitely go see it. That's a twist. That's very twisty. The top 30 now. Pokemon Detective Pikachu. You did it. You did it. You made a Pikachu movie that is not terrible. Thank you Warner Brothers. Thank you Legendary. Thank you the Pokemon Company. It still has problems with the villain. And the plot is basically the same old thing you've seen before. But Pokemon Detective Pikachu works due to Ryan Reynolds' awesome performance as Pikachu and the most capture. Pikachu is looks so cute in this movie. He is so cute in this movie. He's so cool. I really love Pikachu's design in the movie. It looked really great. 
And the other Pikachus was great. Mewtwo and all the other ones, the production design and direction was great. I liked the story. Justice Smith was really good in this movie. Even though I didn't hate him in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, but he was kind of annoying. You also had Catherine Newton, Ken Watanabe, Bill Nighy, Suki Waterhouse, Rita Ora. Come on, it's Rita Ora. She's a great singer. And she's a pretty decent actress. But, yeah, Detective Pikachu. Round of applause. Round of applause. What good. Can't wait for the sequel. And this movie was is a hit with audiences. Years. I was most excited for you to come. Oh boy, I can hear Jerome and everybody who hates this movie now, but it's alright, don't respect the list anyway, but Midsommar Ari Aster delivered once again at first I wasn't the biggest fan of Hereditary but then I gave it a second watch and I really loved it Midsommar surprised me on how good it was Midsommar was so good very well done, very masterfully well done. I would love to see the director's cut, but unfortunately, it's not in the US. But Miss Omar was a damn great horror film from A24. It was amazing. Ari Aster's writing and direction was perfection. This whole movie takes place in the daytime, and that's n you never s see that in the horror movies, which I really appreciate it. I appreciate the themes that they were touching upon, like grief and the Swedish festival and the intensity that they were going on with this movie. And this movie was R-rated to the max. You do get your violence. You do get your language there is some sexual content in, in this movie but the ritual part was fascinating i thought the performances were very well done florence Pugh, unfortunately is going to get snubbed at the oscars but she was still delivered a great performance and so is jack Raynor and the black guy in the movie and um Will Poulter. Florence Pugh show a live emotion. Her and Jack Reno are the two standouts of this movie. You did have some comedy in there that was good, but this is a very intense, serious film, and the cinematography work was great. This movie reminds me of The Wicker Man after what happens to Jack Reno. You know how in The Wicker Man where they burned the little thing with Nicolas Cage was in or the original 1973 one, which I haven't seen? Yeah, there's a scene like that at the end of this movie. And when you find out about the Swedish festival, that was really fun. So, Miss Somar, it's not for everybody, but this is definitely better better than hereditary in my opinion happy death day to you told you I was gonna talk about this one again Jessica Roth Woo. great actress she was great as tree once again there is a lot of moments in this movie that I really loved it did get repetitive her, her having to die over and over again to save her friends but I got it and there was a scene at the end of the movie that I thought was emotional but I can't say what it was but I really dig happy death day to you Jessica Roth was great as tree and the way the, the, the killer kills her in multiple ways it was really fun 
I like the part where she did jump off of the airplane. That was crazy. It was hot, but it was also very entertaining to watch. But this was still a really impressive movie that I definitely wish did more at the box office. It's not as good as the first Happy Death Day, but I do think it it was pretty awesome. It's a damn shame that we're not going to get a third Happy Death Day movie because I would love to have seen that. But oh well, what can you do? At least we got Halloween kills. Nobody's gonna ever do more for you than I do. She's never gonna let us be together. Sooner or later, everybody knows everything about everyone. <laughs> Gypsy Rose Blanchard, how do you plead? The act. This is another miniseries, but this premiered on Hulu, starring Patricia Arquette and Joey King, and this tells the story of Gypsy Rose Blanchard and the abuse she had to put up with her mother, Dee Dee, and her eventual death by her own daughter, and how her mom is lying to her about her illnesses when she can do all the stuff that her mom thought, says she can't do. This was great. The act, it was great, but it, but man, it was a hard watch. The act was a hard watch, especially the shit that her mom puts her through over the course of this miniseries. For all eight episodes of this miniseries, I was feeling it. Not only I was feeling it, my mom also felt it too. So... The performances were great. Kaylin Worthy, Chloe, uh, no, Anna, Anna Sophia Robb, Patricia Arquette is Dee Dee. Outstanding. Out freaking standing. Joey Keane as Gypsy Rose. She was great. I wish this was out on DVD because the act, I would definitely rewatch this again. Because this. It was very dramatic, very serious, and it shows that Joey King, for all those people who said she can't act, Joey King can act her ass off. And she is phenomenal in here. Phenomenal. The act. Fucking awesome miniseries. Able to defeat villain after villain after villain. A certain spark. I will steal that spark <gasps> that makes Kim possible. Get her! <laughs> Mind if we crash the party? It's mission time. Kim Possible, a Disney Channel original. So a stitch. Call me, beat me if you want to reach me. Kim Possible. A live action version of Kim Possible. I didn't think we needed this, but this came in and surprised me like. Surprised you like nothing. Kim Possible was awesome. It's not the best Disney Channel original movie, but it's definitely one of my favorites. I do admit you screwed up some characters like Dragon and Shigo and there are some actors who do get underused. Allison Hannigan as Kim, Kim's mom gets underused. Patton Oswalt gets underused. And that whole twist with Athena. Again, I don't like that. But I do love the character of Athena herself. Ron Stoppable played by... Sean Gambra I thought was really great. I thought with the direction and writing they did what they had to do and the story wasn't the best but it was entertaining enough for a fun Kim Possible live action film. Sierra and the one who played Wade was actually really good too. And some of the CGI is not the best especially on Rufus but you do have to realize this is a Disney Channel original movie and this is not the only Disney Channel original movie you're going to be seeing on this list. But Kim Possible was awesome. Sure, you know that. Yeah. 
so presumptuous. It's been a long time. Giganta. Bigger and better, bitch! <laughs> I do so love mass destruction. What's the matter, princess? Feeling a little slow? You haven't beaten me yet. Poison and Cyber may have declared war on Themyscira. Wonder Woman bloodlines. Not as good as the 2017 film, but it was pretty solid for a Wonder Woman DC Animated Universe original movie. It was fun. It was entertaining. It had its good moments. It wasn't a complete cop out. It was a little too short, but Rosario Dawson as Wonder Woman was great. I love the voice acting. Animation was impressive. The action was nice. I do like the newer villains that they got here. And this was just a really good movie. I'm very surprised at how good this was. I'm very surprised at how good this was. High Life. This was very surprising for A24. Now, this is basically the 2001 A Space Odyssey of this decade and of this generation. A lot of people are going to watch this movie and absolutely hate it, laugh at it, disown it, do whatever you want. But for me, I thought that this was excellent. I thought that High Life was really great. Robert Pattinson, he shows some freaking range in his acting career. He's taking charge. He's like, I'm tired of being known as the freaking vampire I've been taking charge of my career and the performance is real good the rest of the cast was really great Mia Goff, Andre Benjamin, Juliet Binoche there are some hard to watch things in this movie but for the most part I thought that this was a darn great film that definitely lived up to my expectations because I went in with no expectations N knowing nothing and I am glad that I'm glad Patrick Burrow likes this movie too and, and he actually put it on his best of 2019 you can check that out on his channel but this was damn good I don't remember it being this hard Woody somebody's whispering in your ear Toy Story 4. Again, please let this be the last Toy Story movie because we don't need any more Toy Story movies. This was a good way to go with Toy Story. It was great. I love the send off they give for Woody's character. Even though you do kind of retcon Toy Story 3 a little bit, this was still a really great film that definitely warrants a lot of amazing moments, definitely a lot of great moments, definitely a lot of epitastic moments with the cast and the villain, Gabby Gabby, Keanu Reeves' character. Forky was a great addition. I can see why Zach Pope loves Forky. But let's not forget our original actors. And sadly, this is hard to watch with Don Rickles in archival voiceover as Mr. Potato Head. And Blake Clark's still a great substitute for the late Jim Varney as Slinky Dog. But this was a really amazing film. And I can't wait to watch it again eventually when I do get the Toy Story collection, if they put it in a collection with all four films. Pet Cemetery 2019. I thought this was better than the original 1989 Pet Cemetery. Even though I like the original Pet Cemetery a little, 
I respected for at times, but this one was more, for me it was more creepier. It did have some jump scares that didn't need to be there, and it did kind of drag in this pacing, because the movie's only an hour and 40 something minutes. But, I did like the story, I did like the, what the two directors were trying to do with this classic Stephen King story, to try and make it his own. I don't like the alternate end, I, oh, scratch that, the ending, I don't like the ending of the movie though, that's the downfall of the movie is the ending. Even though it does go for what you're doing in the original, it just ends on a cliffhanger. It's like, are you trying to set up a sequel or something? I don't know. I did like the alternate ending though. That was a better ending. I did like the alternate ending. I did like the performances of the cast. The cast did good. Especially Jason Clark, even though the way he's written, he, he's written, he is unlikable after he is so determined to bring his daughter back and John Livico says don't do it, she won't come back as your daughter. Because, and the way they did the whole, they changed around the Gage scene where Gage dies and, and they make it the little girl. That was hard to watch but it was still very much. A good enough Stephen King adaptation for 2018. I know there was another one called In the Tall Grass that came on Netflix, but I didn't see that one. But if I had to pick my favorite Stephen King movie for adaptation of this year, I'm giving the slight edge to It Chapter 2. Even though I did enjoy Pet Cemetery. Whatever you've done, I know there is good inside you. of Guardians of the Galaxy Volumes 1 and 2 and 3, Slither, and the newer version of the Suicide Squad coming out in 2021. This had an interesting concept of what it would be like if Superman was evil, which is what you were going for. And it doesn't fully flesh out his characters as you would as you wanted it to, but it did deliver on the promise of making super uh, evil version of Superman, which in Bart Burns' case it is the Brandon character, and it does deliver on this R rating because when it does, because the movie is it, it is bloody and it is gory, especially the one scene at school with Brandon breaking the little girl's hand, which. Didn't, you didn't see that coming. And it does get pretty bloody towards the end of the movie. There was only a few things I didn't like here, which you needed a little more time for characterization of the mom and dad. You did get enough character of on Brandon, and that was, Jackson Dunn was great as Brandon. I loved him as Brandon. Elizabeth Banks was great as the mom. David Denman was good as the dad, even though I still go by what I said, the dad being in denial. So, the dad, yep, the dad was in denial for the entire movie. So when he got killed off, I was kind of unhappy. But the craziest part is when after he breaks the daughter's hand, and he goes over to the little girl's house and gives her flowers. Then goes to the diner where her mom works and then kills her own mom. That I like. You just pulled, you just, that was just. But Bright Burns was a good movie. 
if they do make a sequel to it, which I doubt they will, I would like to see more of what they could play with with the Bright Brian idea. And I did like the song by Billie Eilish, Bad Guy. Rocket Man. This tells the true story of Elton John and even though I like this a little more than Bohemian Rhapsody because it's more accurate. Even though I did like Bohemian Rhapsody quite a bit, the, the problems that I did have with Bohemian Rhapsody was that it wasn't entirely accurate, but it was still a good movie, and I'm glad Remy Malik won his Oscar for that part. If Taron Egerton doesn't get the Academy Award for this movie, then something is wrong with the Academy because this was a great film and Bryce Dallas Hour, Jamie Bell, the way this movie was written was good. Taron Egerton actually sung all the songs in this movie by that was sung by Elton John in real life. The this movie plays out as a musical fantasy and that's why I liked. I did like the musical fantasy I expect. It did have the problem of it kind of glossing over the darker moments of Elton John's life, but I still cared about Elton John in the story. Because the film does a good job with his direction and writing to make you care about Elton John. In this town, I can all change like that. Hey! You're Rick fucking Dalton. Don't you forget it. We're into the top 20 now. Quentin Tarantino's ninth the movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Two hours and 41 minutes of greatness. I do have a problem of the second half kind of dragging out, but I did enjoy Once Upon a Time in Hollywood a lot. I loved it. I gave it a very positive review. This is Quentin Tarantino's love letter to the 1960s, and you focus on Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt as these two guys who work together. Leonardo DiCaprio is his stunt double and Brad Pitt is the TV star that and you also focus on Sharon Tate man aspect of this movie which even though Margot Robbie she didn't have a whole lot to say she was still great as Sharon Tate and I like the little spin that Quentin Tarantino put on the whole Sharon Tate murders instead of having her get killed he actually has her leave a lot of great performances in this movie as well from Brad Pitt to Leonardo DiCaprio to Margot Robbie to Margaret Qualley as Cat. Which at first that one scene with her with her and Brad Pitt that was pretty funny. It was also pretty cute. You also have Lorenzo Enzo, a lot of great cast in this movie. Al Pacino, Eat Maya Hawk. A lot of performances that were great. I like the soundtrack, the way this movie feels, you are in the 1960s. And this is Quentin Tarantino's most mature movie. Until the last half where it goes into Quentin Tarantino mode. So hopefully for his 10th and final movie, I can't wait to see what he cooks up there. And there's no use of the end word, so that is was a big plus. But once upon a time in Hollywood, definitely a great film. Then enjoy it. I'm gonna get at least a couple of comments asking why is this not higher, but 19th place, Avengers Infinity War Part 2 or Avengers Endgame. 
What more can I say about Avengers in the game at this point? I have praised this movie, everyone has praised this movie. I guess I can say that this was a nice ending to the whole Infinity Saga era, the two part Infinity War story arc with Thanos. Even though we'll get to another movie that also ended the Infinity Saga half of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in just a little bit. I really thought that Avengers Endgame took a risk of wrapping up all the loose ends. A lot of people refer to this as the return of the king of the MCU. I personally refer to this as the Harry Potter and Deathly Hallows Part 2 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Performances all around were great from Scarlett Johansson to Robert Downey Jr. to Brie Larson in her short little screen time Even with the short haircut and when she says that line Hey Peter Parker, you got something for me? I still Thought she was pretty attractive Karen Gillan, Elizabeth Olsen and that final battle was really something and seeing Tony Stark go out the way he does in this movie it was sad and I didn't like the way he went out at first but now I do but I'm glad that it was him and not Nebula because James Gunn I don't think he's done with the character of Nebula just yet fighting with my family at number 18, this was the true story of WWE Diva Page. I didn't expect much out of it, but fighting with my family was really good. I liked the aspect of the story of Page in this movie. Florence Pugh is great as Page. I really like Lena Headey and Nick Frost and The Rock and the. Is it, the one who played her brother, all the performances in this movie were great. I like the fact that it didn't, it shows Paige's rise and her struggles as being trained before you get to the moment at the end of the movie with her and fighting AJ Lee. And this proves that you don't have to be a wrestling fan just to like this movie. And you don't have to be a wrestling fan to enjoy this movie either. And I did like Paige. The fact that Paige actually produced, actually had a hand in, in sight of this movie and she actually liked the, the version of the movie that she was presented to her. So, Fighting With My Family is number 18. Stephen Merchant wrote and directed this is a great film. Love it. Definitely worth a shot. Descendants 3 at number 17. Hard to watch, especially since the fact that one of their main leads is no longer with us. In the case of Cameron Boyce, but Descendants 3 was a good enough finale to the Descendants franchise and this is a series that I I thought I wasn't gonna be into but with the first one but first one came out I really liked it I love the second one and I like this one it was good seeing Mal and her VK friends as well as Uma and her VK friends work together to save Oradon I like that aspect of the movie Cheyenne Jackson as Hades was really great, even though I do wish he was in this movie more. And I feel like he should have been the main villain instead of Audrey, even though Sarah Jeffrey did a good job as Audrey. The songs were still really good. You had a conclusive finale to these characters. And I don't see them continuing this after Kevin Boys is gone, so to me, Descendants 3 is the ending, the end of an era.
Even with his problems, I still have, I still like the Sinister a lot. It's in danger. The world needs the next Iron Man. Are you going to step up or not? Spider-Man Far From Home. Outstanding sequel to Spider-Man Homecoming. Coming off just one year after another Spider-Man movie, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which is it's still the best Spider-Man movie for me, but Spider-Man Far From Home was really good. Love Spider-Man Far From Home, I thought it was great. It had a emotional push. It had a big task to introduce us to a new MCU after the reverse snap. And seeing Peter Parker go through struggle, going through the loss of his mentor at the end of Endgame, spoiler alert, you should have seen Avengers Endgame by now. Because I did like the fact that they went out of the New York location and went to a diff different kind of country. Mysterio and the uh, Illu Illuminati villains, that was really great. I did like Mysterio as a villain, J. Jonah Hall was great. Tom Holland is still great as Spider-Man, Peter Parker. Zendaya, uh, Jacob Balon. It was great seeing Maria Hill and Nick Fury get more to do. And I did like that post credit scene with J.K. Simmons. So if they're willing to bring him back for this current Spider-Man series, bring it on. Yeah, I'm glad that Sony and Marvel and Disney work out the deal to have Spider-Man be in both the MCU and in the, the Sony Marvel Universe. So, Spider-Man... MCU Spider-Man 3. John Wick Chapter 3 Parabellum. Loved John Wick Chapter 3 Parabellum. It was great. It just when you thought it would be the end of the John Wick series. It's not the case because the fourth one is coming out in 2021 as well as Matrix 4. But I'm more targeted to John Wick Chapter 4. Keanu Reeves still being awesome as John Wick. The violence was still pretty good. The action is still really well done. These directors know how to direct their action. They know how to handle the stunts and the action set pieces. The story was very intriguing. Two hours and 11 minutes didn't fill it. Halle Berry, Angelica Houston, Ian McShane, Lawrence Fishburne. The rest, Asia K. Dillon, the, the cast was really awesome. It has some fun moments to it, and while it did, while it's not better than Chapter Two, I do still like John Wick. So this was awesome, and I love John Wick Chapter Three. How to Train Your Dragon Three: The Hidden World. I had no anticipation for how to train your dragon three but after watching the other two and watching this one I thought this was a really good new film how to train your dragon the hit in the world was a emotional send-off but a great send-off for the how to train your dragon trilogy and all three movies are good I loved them all but this one is my second favorite. This, the animation was great. I love the voice acting work from everyone. Jay Bruce Hill, America for He Cups and Toothless and as well as the love interest for the, the dragon friend of He Cups. It was really great. The humor was still nice, the animation was still good, and it had a good story. It had a good story. Do 
Did you see that? Yeah, you electrocuted a bus and almost killed these people. And then I caught it! Shazam at number 13. Now, you people are going to get this one confused with Kazam, but it's not really Kazam, it's Shazam. He's based on a Captain Marvel character created by DC. And also, I'll get to another Captain Marvel movie later on. But Shazam was a solid, fun entry into the DC Cinematic Universe. Don't know why this didn't gross a lot more than it should have, but Zachary Levi was great as the character of Billy Basson and Shazam, as well as Asher Angel. I like the fact that it was big, but what if big was a superhero movie? And it had a lot of heart. And I like the setting of the movie that takes place during the, the holidays. The action was still pretty fun. The humor and direction by David Sandberg was great. The rest of the cast was really good. Mark Strong, Grace Fulton, Megan Good. All oh, the rest of the cast was great. The villain is kind of bleh, but Mark Strong did good as the villain. And I do like that little Indian scene with Superman and the little boy version of Shazam. That was pretty cool. Shazam 2 is going to be happening, so I can't wait to see what Shazam 2 has. Jordan Peele comes back for a second time with his secondary sophomore horror movie, Us. Not everyone is a fan of Us because of the symbolism and the messages that this movie is trying to get across, but Jordan Peele's Us was pretty scary. It was pretty good. I loved a lot of the choices that Jordan Peele was going with in Us. Get Out is still better, but in, if, in terms of the better, in, in terms of the better way of handling scares, Get Out still takes the win. But Us did have a, a more interesting story that was just as interesting as Get Out's story. Lupita Nyong'o, Winston Duke, the two kids, having to play the doppelganger version of themselves. It reminds, it reminds you of the episode, old episode of The Twilight Zone where you do have a doppelganger in the mirror. Which, uh, that was Jordan Peele's influence for Us. And for those who have seen the movie, you, you probably, some of them might have gotten scared to want to go into the mirror because they're afraid of having a doppelganger showing up. <laughs> the cinematography aspect was really good. The music was great. As I just mentioned, the performances were really great. Everything about us was good and initially I didn't like how the movie ended but then I basically did watch it again and do a, a couple few more times and the ending grew up grew on me I would go more into the messages and symbolism but I'm gonna leave a link down below to Zach Pope's um, video essay on this movie because you're, then you'll get the message. Uh, what is going on? I don't know. Number 11, we have The Unicorn. This was a fun little comedy, independent comedy that no one saw except but me, unfortunately. But it was still a nice little film that was still funny and still has some good performances here from the cast. Laura Lapkus, Lucy Hale, and everybody all did a good job. They did have a sense of heart to it, the direction by Robert Schwartzman. I mean, Jason Schwartzman was really great. 
cinematography was nice. I did like the writing here, even though some of it was a little questionable. And a lot of the characters here were likable. It was a simple enough movie to put on the list for how entertaining it was. And it was, it was great. I'm with her. Now we're into the 10 best movies of this year. And we will conclude this. Number 10 is Alita Battle Angel. This was a great manga adaptation. And I did classify it in my comic book ranking of 2019. Even though it's based on a Japanese manga. Even a lot of the years that this took take to make. But Alita Battle Angel was good enough manga and it shows that anime adaptations if you do them right they can be good done well unfortunately this for this movie it was the bomb in the u.s but overseas did better i guess the u.s just doesn't care about manga adaptations but i did Robert Rodriguez directed this one. This is the best movie he's done since the El Marachi films and Spy Kids films. Well, the first three, not the fourth Spy Kids movie. James Cameron was the producer. He knew what he wanted to do. The motion capture work on Alito was great. I like the world building and the design of the world that this movie takes place in. Rosa Salazar was absolutely great, and she's also pretty gorgeous as a leader. Christoph Waltz, Isaac Gonzalez, Ed Screen, Jennifer Connelly, Mahashala Ali, Ken Johnson, all the cast was great. The music was great, the motorball sequence, and the action scenes with a leader were awesome to watch. I, the romance was iffy, but it was more, it was tolerable than Tessa and Hardy. Anything is better than that, the, that romance. Because, yeah, after. I have a special place for after in my worst movies of the decade. That's coming. 2020. It's the ground. Well, Lead of Battle Angel was a good, good time. one side. Lucy! Em, did you draw stubble dots on your face? What? No. <laughs> Who are you? I'm your worst nightmare. You're me when I'm late to school and I forgot my homework and my pants are made of pudding? No, I don't. <laughs> the Lego Movie 2, the second part. Another movie that no one cared for about, even though a lot of people were pretty excited when they announced the sequel to this because they didn't expect the first Lego movie to be good. I, did, I didn't, I did but it looked like fun. And it was fun. Lego Movie 2, the second part, was just as good as the first one. It does sacrifice a little bit from the original Lego movie, but the animation on the Lego walls was still pretty good. I still like the voice acting from Chris Pratt, Elizabeth Banks, Allison Brie, Will Arnett. I still like all of the different scenes, all the different versions of Legos. And the story was intriguing enough. And the soundtrack while it was not as good as the first soundtrack, it was still a pretty good soundtrack. Tiffany Haddish was just there, just to be there. Because it's Tiffany Haddish, and they want to put Tiffany Haddish in every single movie. And She's not really that funny, but Lego Movie, she was, she did her job here. So we're not going to give her the Lego Movie, but Lego Movie 2, the second part, was good. Light 
Zombie Land Double Tap at number eight. This was a fun sequel to Zombie Land, coming years, ten years after its predecessor. The first one came out in 2009. This one, 2019. So I see what they were doing there. Zombie Land Double Tap was just as hilarious as the first Zombie Land. You got you. It feels like you never left the characters of Tallahassee, Columbus, Little Rock, and Wichita. It feels like you, you never left the zombie land world. You're still there as soon as the movie starts. Tallahassee is still the same, the same old Tallahassee that we got from the first one. Woody Harrelson still make, makes you laugh. Jesse Eisenberg, Emma Stone, and Abigail Breslin were still really great in their roles. Ruben Fleischer and the Riot and the Riders of Deadpool did a good job with the sequel, and this was a nice redemption for Ruben Fleischer after last year's Venom, which we will not speak of. That's also going to be on the worst movies of the decade, but. Zombie Land Double Tap was fine. I liked the new characters of Madison, who's played by Zoe Dutch, Rosario Dawson as Nevada. It still has some fun, fun moments, fun zombie action, it's still blade. Nothing is is off limits this time. And I like some of the ideas with the zombies, including the one zombie named Homer, which is a reference to The Simpsons. That was a good reference to The Simpsons, because I do love The Simpsons. Thomas Middleditch and um, Luke Wilson didn't really do, do much. I did like Avin Jogia as a Berkeley. And the end of the movie with the climax with them fighting the zombies was pretty fun. And that after credit scene with Bill Murray being interviewed for a fake Garfield 3 and he's fighting zombies and everyone in the interview, in, in the press, is turning the zombies. That was fun. Hopefully, we get a third one because I would like to see a third one as well as a spinoff of Madison. But we'll see where it goes. But good job on Sony's part and on the filmmakers in that cast part of the Zombie Land Double Tap. The King. That's messed up. This is guys in this world. He's just living. Damn right. This is gonna be a bit of a controversial one, but Godzilla 2 or Godzilla King of the Monsters. Five years after 2014 Godzilla, then one year after Kong Skull Island, Warner Brothers and Legendary. Once again, continues this kaiju cinematic universe with Godzilla King of the Monsters. This is easily my favorite of the Monsterverse. It was Godzilla 2014, but now that movie's been dethroned by this one. It just had a lot more Godzilla in it. But for some reason, people still complained. Because it was too much monster action and not enough focus on the humans' the story. Unless you are the 1954 original, the 2014 reboots, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, and Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, you're not gonna care about every other human in the same way. They think Godzilla's the bad guy, and then when they find out Godzilla's the good guy, they find the device to help him, then he get Godzilla fights the monster, gets get gets 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 handed down to him in the first fight. Second fight is the same thing. Third time he they uses the device and he win, he wins. It's the same thing in all the Godzilla movies, guys. But I did like seeing more of Godzilla. I did like um Michael Daughtry's direction, you can tell he is a Godzilla fan. God, and seeing the new monsters in Godzilla's long-running universe is pretty good. Rodan had his own sequence with the military. I like 
his scene with he attacks the military and Rodan was well done. Ghidorah was pretty was pretty bad for a Godzilla villain. Now I can see why everybody loves Ghidorah. And, and Mothra was beautifully created from visual effects. And so all four monsters got their moments shine. The battle in Boston was pretty fun to see with Godzilla and all the monsters fighting, especially with Mothra shows up and she webs Ghidorah's head to two heads to three heads to a building. Then Godzilla just tackles him and then throws him <laughs> to the building. And the human characters are not the greatest, but I did like the cast in the human characters. Vera Farmiga, Kyle Chandler, Millie Bobby Brown. Ice Cube's son, who was pretty funny. Mm -hmm. We can't wait for Godzilla vs. Kong next year. It was originally supposed to come out in March, but now you have to wait until November because they pushed it back. But I'm just gonna say it King Kong, you don't stand a chance with Godzilla. Even though I love King Kong, Godzilla is gonna, gonna get you. He's gonna get you. Again, God's looking at monsters was fun. And ha ha same with this one. And then you have a nice little reference to Dragon Ball Z, which Captain Marvel going Super Saiyan. Just like in God's looking at the monsters with Ghidorah, so, I mean, Godzilla throwing Ghidorah into the I don't building. Think that is the brown rice. And also, that reference at the at the end of King of the Monsters with Godzilla on fire, that was a nice reference to the burning Godzilla in the Godzilla versus Destoria or Destoria. So if they do put Destoria in the monster verse after Godzilla vs. Kong in a possible third Godzilla movie, that would be cool. But I would like to see Mothra come back. Because the door you dare wrong he was there wrong for um killing Mothra, but I got that. No, hey, what the fuck is this? We ask the questions Tonight is your night. Make her feel good. Mm. Make it stop. Please don't put your face no. on the face, not on the head. Number six is Book Smart. This was a funny comedy. This is easily my favorite comedy of the decade and my favorite comedy of this year, besides Zombie Land Double Tap. It's basically a, the female version of the Super Bad. But it's more raunchy, it's more cursing, it's more profanity. But it still had a heart to it. And that's what I liked about Booksmart. Even though it was a different take on the whole high school super bad movie, it was still pretty, pretty, pretty refreshing. It had enough in there to make something different. Olivia Wilde, for her directorial debut, she nailed it. The two, the chemistry of the two leads, Beanie Feldstein and Caitlin Dever, that was really great. The, Jason Sudeikis was pretty funny. The rest of the cast was really funny, including Billy Lord and Carrie Fisher Law. A lot of the jokes I laughed at. I loved a lot of the, joke, the humor in this movie. The doll scene was hilarious. <laughs> the doll scene was funny. I did not expect that to happen, but the doll scene was hilarious. I really like that. And there's not much more I can say about Book Smart. This was just a funny comedy. It knew what it was. It it said, You want you want a comedy? We're gonna give you a comedy and you and you're gonna laugh all the way through. And that's what I did with Book Smart. I laughed all the way through. Stephen King's Doctor Sleep 
was number five. A sequel to The Shining. A lot of people were skeptical because The Shining is one of their favorite. When you go look at most people, they will say The Shining is one of their favorite Stephen King movies. And the fact that they made a sequel to The Shining in this decade, 40 years after the original from 1982, Dr. Sleep was, was, I gotta tell you, it was excellent for a sequel and the day after I watched the day I watched this movie I did post my initial reaction to it the composers of the movie they actually liked my tweet and retweeted my tea my tweet about the new inverters they did a good job to score but it's really Mike Flanagan's direction and writing that makes Dr. Sleep as great as it is Ewan McGregor is Danny Torrance. I liked the direction they took Danny with him suffering through alcoholism and su suffering through the traumas of that night when his dad went crazy. Kylie Curran as the little girl, she was really great, who has the same powers as Danny. Rebecca Ferguson was excellent as the villain. Rose the Hat, definitely one of the best villains of 2019. A lot of the rest of the cast, Cliff Curtis, Emily Allen, Lynn, Bruce Greenwood, a lot of the performances in this movie were strong. And the direction was strong. It, it took us, and I appreciate the fact this movie was 2 hours and 32 minutes long. While it did drag in the first half, I did like Doctor Sleep a lot for taking this time to make us care about the main characters as well as giving you reasons to care about the villain. And it did deliver on the thrill. So if you're going in looking for a jump scare after jump scare after jump scare every five minutes, that's not the movie you got here. You got a character study and a character driven film with some good heart old Stephen King thrills. And you do have some nostalgia moments from The Shining that are recreated, but I thought it was well created. It wasn't a complete insult to The Shining. It's a shame that this movie didn't do so well at the box office because it definitely deserved more attention. It's especially the fact that it got a lot of great positive reception. But Doctor Sleep is definitely one of my favorites. I Shyamalan concluded his trilogy with Glass. Which this is the crossover between Unbreakable and Split. With Bruce Willis's his character from Unbreakable, Samuel Jackson as Mr. Glass, and James McAvoy playing all the different split personalities once again. I would say Glass, this was good. This was a great way to send off his trilogy. Unbreakable is my favorite. I really love Unbreakable. Split was really great. And from the minute the movie ended with that scene with Bruce Willis, I knew what, what they were saying. He was setting, M. Night Shyamalan was setting up. He was setting up this crossover with all his characters from Unbreakable and Glass, and we do have Anya Taylor Joy back as Casey Cook. I can't wait to see her in New Mutants next year. Sarah Paulson from American Horror Story, she was great in here as Dr. Ellie Staple. I don't watch American Horror Story, but I do like Sarah Paulson as an actress. She did a good job here. I did like the direction and writing that they were going for here. I can. A lot of people expected this to be a wall to wall action film, but just like Dr. Sleep, you got a character study instead. And I appreciate a character study. I didn't like the ending when I first watched the movie, but after I processed the ending and watched the, the, the movie a couple more times, 
I appreciated the ending for M. Night Shyamalan. He was trying to be ballsy and in the way of killing all three of his main characters from Glass and from Unbreakable and Split. In the way the second half is done, I really like. I'm a fan of deconstruction. I'm a fan of deconstructing a char characters, especially in Watchmen. This reminded me a lot of Watchmen, so Glass was really good. Definitely an underrated one for sure. Top three movies that had the most impact on me. Fall in Love and First Kiss. This is a Japanese, Taiwanese romance film. It's all subtitled. I didn't complain. It was two hours and two minutes. I didn't complain. Everybody sit down. And this is e Fall in Love First Kiss. Easily my favorite romance movie of the year. And I cared about the two leads in this movie. A lot more than I did with Tessa Young and the Hard and Sky and After. But Fall in Love First Kiss definitely showed what you can do when you have put effort into a romance film. And the romance in this movie, I bought the romance between the two leads. At first, the main guy, he's trying to not think about her. And the main girl is considering giving up on trying to get the main guy to like her. But I felt the two chemistry between the two leads. So when they ended up together later on in the movie, I, I actually kept, bought it. The direction and writing was really great. The way the cinematography was e excellent. I loved the way it, it played out. It wasn't boring. It wasn't. It did have its usual problems with the film kind of slowing down, and and there was times where it did. There were it, there were some moments that I didn't really get, but Fall in Love First Kiss was still a great romance film. I'm glad I gave it a shot, and it was great. Loved Fall in Love First Kiss. War is just the beginning. I'm not gonna fight your war. I'm gonna end it. Top two favorites of this year that that impacted me and entertained me the most. Captain Marvel. A lot. And I mean a lot of people. You have both sides of the MCU split. You have people who really love this movie. You have people who think it's in between, okay, disappointing. And then you have your usual haters. And most of the hate for this movie is completely unjustified. Simply because of the comments that Brie Larson said when she really wasn't trying to offend anybody. She was just trying to say she wanted more equality in film critics, which I, which I get that. What she was trying to say. She could have worded it a little bit better, but it doesn't change the fact that Captain Marvel was a great film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In the first good way to start the MCU female-led films. Wonder Woman is still better. But on, on, when you don't compare it to Wonder Woman, Captain Marvel is great in its own right. There is a lot of amazing, great parts in this movie. Brie Larson, I thought she, a lot of people really like her in, as this character. A lot of people really hate her as this character. And some thought she was eh. But I thought Brie Larson did a great job as Captain Marvel. She... She, she really did a, a great job. Brie Larson, she's hot. 
in that costume. And any guy who would not want to date Brie Larson, check check out this picture. Yeah, I can see why John Avenger 7195 likes her. And she is going to do a lot more in the next decade than Kristen Stewart will ever do. And I loved, I loved the action. The action was really great. I liked the trying scene. I liked the final battle where she, where she basically Go Super Saiyan. I love that part. I love that. That was awesome. Samuel Jackson was great as Nick Fury. The de-aging that they effects that they used to make him look younger than he actually is was really good. And the rest of the performances were, were strong. From Digimon Hounsu to Lashana Lynch to Gemma Chan, even though I didn't really like her character in the movie. Jude Law. Which he wasn't in this movie as much, mainly because he was shooting Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald. It sucks that I have to wait another year for Harry Potter movie number 11. But it's alright, as long as you get, as long as you give me a good story, I ain't gonna complain. But Captain Marvel, it did have its problems, but Captain Marvel was great. And is one of the more underrated films of this year. It wasn't deserving of the hate, nor was Godzilla King of the Monsters. Captain Marvel worthy, is worthy of my support. Don't do that again. The police found your husband. <gasps> and you've been a bad person. But it's okay. So I got you back now. I tried to hide from it. Run! Run! To run from it. Now I'm gonna end it. Now for my favorite movie of 2019. This is the movie that almost that no one really saw and nobody really heard of. This was released at the film festivals back in 2018, but didn't get released until March of this year. And that movie was A Vigilante. And it's been a vigilante. Well, a vigilante was was great. I loved a vigilante. Sarah Sarah Dagger Nixon was great. Olivia Wilde was great. Even at 35 years old, she is high as hell. Look at her. And in this movie with her, I like, A Vigilante had a good story of Olivia Wilde's character, Sadie, going around helping is helping people, victims of domestic abuse, escape through domestic abusers, with her being a victim of domestic abuse herself with her ex-husband. And you get character death for her and seeing how she lost her son. And the part where she does get back at her domestic abuser, that was pretty good. And this movie is R-rated for a reason. It is brutal. It is tough to watch. Especially if you're someone who's been through domestic violence. But a vigilante deserved a lot more appreciation from a lot more people. Not everyone is a fan of the movie, but a vigilante was a great film. In my opinion, and easily the best movie of 2019 for me, easily. But there you have it. Those are my favorite movies of 2019. All 65 movies. I know that this was a, this is a long video in the process, but that's why I warned you at the beginning. So let me know what you guys think of my favorite movies of 2019 down below. I do have one more year in 2019 thing related to do. And I'll see you guys for that. You guys keep cool. Join the Epitaxinus. Be sure to follow all my social media links in the description box down below. As well as check out my merchandise store. And I'll see you guys for that.